One line that stood out to me from your notes to us, consumption, the only potential engine of growth for 2024 for China is consumption. Just unpack that line for us. Well, you know, for a large economy, there are only two sources of growth, investment and, and consumption. The trade surplus doesn't really matter. And if you go through the various components of investment, there are three big areas. There is the property sector, which at best will stabilize and probably contract this year. There is infrastructure investment, but there is increasing evidence that Beijing is very concerned about the, the sort of non-productive direction of infrastructure spending. So we're already starting to see some constraints this year. And then finally, there is the big shift to manufacturing. But as you know, an expansion in China's share of global manufacturing, which is what this requires, requires also that the rest of the world accommodate it. And it's pretty clear that the rest of the world does not want to accommodate an expansion in, uh, in Chinese manufacturing. So we're left with consumption. And they've been reluctant up until this point, Michael, as, as you pointed out, to go down the route of cash handouts to households. But you think that maybe changes towards the end of this year? Yeah, because when you think about um, how we can get consumption to drive the market, there's basically two ways, right? One way is we hope for a revival in confidence that sets off that, that revival in consumption that we were all expecting last year. That could happen, but there's no particular reason to expect it to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then what we're really left with is fiscal stimulus directed to the household sector. Now, China has said that it won't do that. This is what the US and Europe did, for example, during the COVID period. They said they won't do that, but I don't really see any alternative. If the other things don't work and that's all you have left, then basically that's probably what you're going to have to do. Hmm. There is a, there's a line that they're going to shift. What the, the policy focus is on shifting from infrastructure investment, property investment, to high-end manufacturing investment. What, what is the constraint to that policy play? Well, you know, China is about 17, 18 percent of, uh, of global GDP. Consumption, Chinese consumption, is about 13 percent of global consumption. Uh, manufacturing is an astonishing 31% of global manufacturing. So that's really the problem. When China was a much smaller share of the world, it could expand manufacturing without putting too much pressure on the rest of the world. But it already accounts for nearly one third of global manufacturing. So any expansion driven by an increase in the manufacturing share of GDP must come, must be accommodated by a reduction in manufacturing in the rest of the world. And if you look at what they're saying in the US, in India, Japan, Europe, it's not really clear where that where that contraction is going to come from on the property sector Michael we talked to Standard Chartered CEO HSBC CEO earlier this year they say they do see a bottom starting to come through for the property sector do you see a turnaround in that sector this year um, not yet. You know, property prices reach levels that, you know, we hadn't really seen before, except in the case of Japan in the 1980s. So they're still pretty expensive, and I think they're still going to come down. I think there will be more attempt to slow down the pace at which it comes down. But so far, it's been contracting pretty rapidly, and at best, we can get a slowdown in the contraction. And as we look ahead, and we have to think about politics always now when we think about the Chinese economy, we look ahead to the election in the U.S. in November. Does either Biden or Trump, whoever comes to power after that election, change the dynamic for China's economy? That's a really important question, Tom, and I think a lot of people assume that it is going to change because when we think about Biden's policies, they're focused towards what, what is called industrial policy. Whereas uh, the people around Trump have been talking more about trade policy. But I think the important point to make here is that for, from an economic point of view, there's no meaningful difference between trade policy and industrial policy. In both cases, they represent policies that are going to shift income from the household sector to the manufacturing sector in an attempt to grow the manufacturing share of, of the U.S. economy. So no matter who becomes president, I'm pretty sure we're going to continue moving in that direction.